First of all, thank you for the invitation of speaking here today. And I think my talk will be slightly different than the ones you've heard before, but it fits perfectly well with what uh, Mansetsa Marope already said in the beginning, education is the key to all of it. And it also fits very well with the talk of uh, Lagram uh, from the uh, Coventry University, uh, where he sort of laid the scope for this presentation. I'm going to talk about science and technology uh, without walls, and I want to go a little bit more in detail. So the outline of my talk will be first to position science and technology so we know what we talk about, first give sort of a definition, then I will talk a little bit about the history, the presence, and the future of science and technology without walls, and I will leave you with a few take-home messages. If we talk about science and technology, we very often think in terms of one dimension. Let's say there's basic science or fundamental science on the one end, and there's applied science on the other end. That's too simple a picture, and it disturbs a lot of things. We should think first on the question. Where does the question come from? Does the question come at the one extreme from curiosity, or does it come at the other extreme from utility? Uh, that is the one dimension. The other dimension is, of course, how do you approach this question? How do you work as a scientist or researcher on this question? In a fundamental way or in a much more pragmatic way? And in this quadrant system, which was also set up by Mr. Stokes in the past, you can position the different types of universities. First of all, the comprehensive universities in the lower left corner, most of it curiosity-driven in a fundamental approach. The lower right corner, you see the universities of technology, many times working on, uh, let's say, usefulness-driven questions, but in a fundamental way because they are a university, then you can place in the same system the technological institutes, which are doing the same thing with a shorter time frame and therefore in a little bit more pragmatic way, and of course the industry approaching a lot of technology as well. Of course, what you would like to see is that uh, science on the position on the upper left uh, immediately connects to technology uh, in the position uh, to the right. Uh, this is my definition for science, curiosity-driven fundamental approach, and technology covers the whole range from usefulness-driven fundamental approach to usefulness-driven uh, and a more pragmatic approach. So going directly from the lower left corner to the upper right corner is what you theoretically would like to see, but that doesn't happen. Normally, you start with a question, a usefulness-driven uh, question in the right-hand lower corner. Uh, a lot of, let's say, more fundamental questions arise, and you'll end up, hopefully, in the top-end corner with an answer. Let me show that again. So you start... So, ah, it doesn't work that way. Let's see if I can go back. Yes. So you start... No, it still doesn't go back. Uh, I'll try it again. Yep, now it should do it. You start in the lower right corner, and you may end up uh, with an answer in the upper right corner. Well, you could also give names to these quadrants. In the lower left, you would say this is Bohr. Bohr was a scientist in Denmark, uh, lived from uh, 1885 until 1962. He traveled uh, from Copenhagen to Manchester, uh, then to Sweden and to the United States because of the war, and he played it for more openness to the East and the West. Uh, but he was a curiosity-driven scientist doing fundamental research. Pasteur, who lived from uh, 1822 to 1895, raised the question, what can I do with the microorganisms I find if I can kill these microorganisms or if I can use them? Uh, typically a usefulness-driven question, he approached in a very fundamental way. And Edison, we all know, uh, who uh, sort of de developed the telephone, we say, uh, he was a very pragmatic uh, scientist, uh, and I would say as long as it works, it works, and you don't have to understand why. You could fill the, the, the last quadrant in the upper left corner with somebody like Linnaeus, uh, who did the classification of plants, but that is usually left out. Now, so if we would talk about science and technology with some walls, we talk about the past. In the past, you had these people like Bohr, Pasteur, Edison, traveling around the world. Uh, but if we look back a little bit further in the past, uh, then you find Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, uh, uh, by the way, uh, born and raised in Delft, doing his work in the Delft. And he was the one who first saw microorganisms through the exclusive micro 
microscopes he produced. So this is such a, a picture of a microscope uh, over there. The small black dot is the lens, and this was his trick. He could make, grind, and finish lenses nobody else could, and he didn't tell the trick to other people as well. Uh, he, by that, was able to see all kinds of small, he called them little animals, but they were very small, they were microorganisms exactly, and they did, he didn't know the name yet, but also sperma cells, and he was the one that suggested that life did not evolve from non-living matter by itself, but that life evolved from life before, and that there were spores involved, that, that there were uh, uh, semen involved, uh, involved etc. So Anthony van Leeuwenhoek is typically uh, a scientist uh, who was working and living in Delft, only speaking Dutch, but Reinier de Graaf, also living in that city, was able to connect him to the Royal Society in London, where he became a member due to his outstanding results, Without ever speaking a foreign language, he was able to send letters to this Royal Society. The Royal Society translated these letters in English and in Latin. They were distributed the world, so he created a world without walls on his knowledge. If we look at the present time, uh, and I make a big step now, I could also talk about Spinoza and Erasmus, people traveling the world in the uh, 17th century, in the 15th century, uh, one of them with the languages, the other with a lot of travel, uh, who covered a lot. Or I could talk about my own experience in Africa, where there was still a separation of the races, uh, ras and apartheid, and you could easily, as a scientist, come in and do scientific world work with the people there. Or my experience in Russia, where we're setting up connections uh, completely different culture. Trade is, uh, to a large extent, uh, prohibited, but science can, can easily travel over these uh, boundaries. Uh, if we look at today's world, we see it almost, and I say almost unrestricted travel because we all know it's not unrestricted completely. We see some open access, and by open access I mean open access publications, and uh, that is a very important development which is taking place nowadays. The normal system is, as a scientist, you produce a paper, you send it to a journal. The journal may even charge you something in order to get it published. But first of all, before it gets published, it has to be reviewed. Your fellow scientists have to do the work. So you did the science. You send it a paper. You may pay for it. Then you can review it for your fellow scientists. And then they publish it. And then you can buy the journal. So this is a very interesting uh, economic model for the publishers, but not for the science, and especially not for the distribution of science. The new system, which we're developing and which is also pushing very hard by the European uh, Commission is what is called open access, where the producer of the science pays for it. It gets reviewed, of course, by the other scientists because you have to check the quality, but then it's free for everybody. It's open to all of the world to consume that knowledge. And this is going to be a major change, uh, a game changer, I would say, if we really get to that. Another game changer which is taking place at the moment is called MOOCs. MOOCs are massive open online courses. The Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands has 20,000 students on campus. We are covering today 250,000 students with our MOOCs. Uh, so these are open online courses. Everybody can follow for free for the time being. Uh, there will be a, a sort of business model in the, in the, in the future, but it is a, a way to bring education to the rest of the world. I'm talking about University education in our case, but of course it is not limited to university education. As we have seen, and as I said, Mansetsa Marope already pressed on this today, the education is the prime driver for development. It's very easy to prove that without education, a country is not developing well. Well, the internet, another thing uh, invented by scientists in CERN in Switzerland, for those who do not know. It was first developed for their own interaction and later on became what it is now today. Could we think about living without the internet? Is it possible that we can think of a life without the internet? Well, it was not there 25 years ago, I can tell you. It was there, but it was not widely used. Many well-educated, well-connected people is what the world has today to offer. And that is, I think, the way to a world without walls. I said a world with less walls today and a world without walls in the future. A few ingredients for this future world and a few remarks with what I think the future world in science and technology will offer. First, I would like you to learn a term. Uh, it's called FAIR data, and it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. 
We are producing nowadays in science and technology more data every year than the rest of history has produced. Think about it again. More data every year than the rest of history has produced. That means more than doubling the rate of data per year. These data are worthless if they disappear as zeros and ones in a computer or on a disk or somewhere, or if they're not used at all. These data can mean something to the rest of the world if they're properly uh, uh, stored, if you can find them, if you can access them, if other people can access them. That means they have to be interoperable. This is a difficult word, but it, ba word, but it basically means that the metadata, the data describing where the data are, what they mean, what they stand for, how they can be accessed, that the metadata are also in a standard way uh, available and that the data can be reused because they are available. That we called fair data because of the first letters of those four words. It has nothing to do with fair, but it's an interesting acronym because it has something to do with fair as well. If you think about what I would call fair science, this is not an existing term, and I'm uh, challenging you today to adapt this term, uh, so I'm coining it today. Uh, I would call open access, real open access of all uh, science produced, of course, not the science produced in industry, which the industry pays for. They have the right to keep it secret for some time. I'm talking about science produced by, uh, let's say, taxpayers' money, which is most of the science in the world. Open data. I just said something about the requirements for open data. Open source. That means the software you produce can also be used by others. And last but not least, open education, which limits itself not to MOOCs, it is blended learning in the general sense. There's Spocks, there's MOOCs, there is uh, video courses. There's a lot on the internet already uh, in a standardized way, available for everybody, free, as far as I'm concerned. That I would call fair science. And if we can come to a fair science, science and technology, if you want to approach of the world, I'm sure the world will be a better world. Let me give you. Uh, three take-home messages. Science and technology cannot be defined in a one-dimensional way. I told you, if you think about science and especially technology, you need two dimensions. You think about where the question comes from and you think about how you approach this question. And the last one basically means the time frame in which you want to have the answer. Secondly, oh well, this was supposed to be the third. Let's see if the second one comes as well. It comes. Secondly, science and technology will be increasingly without walls. I hope I've shown you that already in this 15th, 16th, 17th century, there were some scientists traveling the world or getting their material over the world by translating and sending it to other scientists. But what we see nowadays with the internet and what we will see in the future, I can predict easily, uh, is much more than that. Uh, that is a, a world without walls for science and technology. And as I have shown, this will probably help for the rest of the world. So fair science will lead to a more connected and, for me, a fairer world. Thank you for your attention.